But then you need all of these kind of complementary indicators of progress toward all of the other goals that um, voters have. And uh, one of the most important is looking at population and uh, whether we are reaching some kind of stabilization of population. Um, education, uh, you know, look, looking at literacy rates and um, other kinds of indicators. Uh, health, nutrition, basic services, shelter, uh, public safety and crime, uh, child development, uh, political participation, uh, air and water quality, uh, environmental resource depletion, biodiversity, uh, species loss, as well as culture and recreation. Um, I think that more and more we're beginning to realize that um, you can create a very good uh, economic development strategy in a community uh, around uh, cultural resources. I think, you know, Minneapolis is a good example of that. And so, basically, what I'm trying to do with these indicators is not roll them all into one very highly aggregated number that nobody understands and try to turn them all into money coefficients like the economists want to do. I'm saying, let's have them all unbundled so that everybody can see all the different aspects of quality of life and progress that are important to us as voters. Because that way, we can begin making politicians accountable. And if a politician says they're the education president, okay, let's look at the literacy rates. Or if they're going to do something about health care, let's watch um, life expectancy and into mortality. And the environmentalist can watch the air and water quality uh, indicators. And this way, uh, we can judge uh, politicians by results rather than by all of this mumbo jumbo, highly aggregated uh, macroeconomic statistics. So I'm happy to say that there's about 20 countries in the world that are adopting some uh, uh, or other aspects of these kind of quality of life indicators, which I think will be the way that countries will compete against each other in the future. And when you begin to have a, a view beyond this mere um, very narrow accounting system, I think then you can begin to see that uh, we could do a lot of things to make this a better world that we don't think we can do if we only look at um, the GNP kind of numbers. And this uh, little diagram I like a lot. This, each one of these squares represents a billion dollars. And this is um, the trillion dollars that the world spends every year on uh, arms that are going all over the place, you know, Lord knows where they're all going. Many of them are going in the Southern Hemisphere now. And here we realize that we could solve every major problem on this planet with less than one quarter of the annual arms budget. For example, we could prevent soil erosion for only 24 billion a year. We could provide clean, safe, renewable energy to every country in the world for 17 billion. We could bring every country in the world up to the best energy efficiency standard for only 33 billion. Uh, we could retire all of the debt of the developing nations for 30 billion. We could provide shelter for everybody on this planet for 21 billion. We could prevent acid rain for 8 billion. We could provide safe, clean water for everybody on the planet for 50 billion, and so on and so on. Eliminate starvation and malnutrition for 19 billion. But it's very good to see that within the context of how much is spent on arms each year. So I think that um, more of us are beginning to realize that it is doable to work toward more of a win-win world and that maybe in the next few years we're going to realize that the visionaries and the idealists really are more practical than the so-called realists. Thank you.
any comments or questions? Wow. So I can't see there in the dark. Yes, sir. Well, it's very interesting if you look at um, if you look at my kind of indicators, uh, Costa Rica is one of the, the best countries in the world if you look uh, on the whole, um, the whole gamut of these kind of indicators. And of course that's partly because they've never had an army. And so where other countries have been investing, or at least they, they haven't had an army since 1947. And so they've been investing in their people, in education, in health care. Uh, they're, they're now investing in their rainforests and their biodiversity, uh, in their social justice system, uh, in their cultural uh, resources. Uh, they're, they, they're not at the top. I mean, the thing is that what I'm trying to get away, get away from in my sort of indicators is this um, very simplistic, competitive, you know, who's at the top sort of thing. Because really, all, all of these quality of life indicators are based on culture. And each country has a different kind of cultural DNA. As if, you, if you will, about what their goals are and what's important to them. And so all of these indicators do have to be constructed with the democratic goals of that society. And so they're not always going to be completely comparable. But um, uh, in what I'm really hoping to do with this, rather than having uh, yet another set of numbers come out where you say this country is the top, um, what I'm hoping to do is to do a TV show um, which, which we'll call the Country Scorecard Show, where we can just every week look at a different aspect of the quality of life and compare um, different countries' performance in that particular area and relate it to the democratic goals of those countries. But I think that this is really the only way to get people back into politics um, is if they can actually see the results, um, and not in money terms, but uh, in terms which are to do with the real world, like parts per million of particulates and sulfur oxides in urban air, or um, you know how many species are being lost, and those kind of uh, real world indicators. Yes. Say a more about Florida and Oh, yeah. Well, one, well, one of the, uh, the more interesting uh, things that I found in Florida that I had nothing to do with at all is um, that I found a city in Florida, which is near where I live, Jacksonville, where they've been using these kind of quality of life indicators since 1983, and they're very similar to the kind of indicators that I'm advocating at the national level. And um, what they're doing now is they've, they've got a citizen participation exercise where they're literally bringing thousands of people into City Hall, and they have all of these indicators. They have 83 different indicators. and. Um, they are bringing people in, they call it Target 2000, and they're saying, look, are we asking enough of ourselves um, with this indicator? Should we make the target higher? Should we go for you know, more, a fewer dropouts, or um, should we tighten up on air quality standards? And everybody now is getting into the act of calibrating these indicators um, based on what the voters want. So if any of you want to get a copy of the Jacksonville Quality of Life Indicators, you just write to the Chamber of Commerce, and um, they publish them. And I find almost everywhere I go, I do um, throw a slide up of, on those indicators. And uh, it's been very encouraging to find uh, wherever there's a city council person in a group I'm talking to, um, I get 
word back from the Jacksonville Chamber of Commerce now that they're studying their indicators in Auckland, New Zealand, in Eugene, Oregon, in Boise, Idaho, in Anchorage, Alaska, almost everywhere I went, you know, the last uh, two or three weeks or months. So uh, this is something where we don't have to wait for the national governments to do it. It can be done uh, very simply. And I think that at this point, the Jacksonville Chamber of Commerce um, almost has a profit center in these indicators. They're probably at the stage where they could sell you the kit if you wanted to do it in Ames, Iowa, or if you want to do it in Des Moines. They'll just send you, sell you all the floppy disks and you can just do it yourselves. <laughs> Um, I think it's go well. I think it's going to be quite different, you know. If you if um, if people get to understand that a, a rising GNP can be a problem, and and that's what I'm saying, is that a, a, that's what's happened in the past ten years. You know that um, continual growth of GNP beyond a certain point um, begins to rack up these um, these kind of hidden costs. And that what it can really do is to get you into prevention. And we all know that prevention is much cheaper than uh, trying to fix things up after they've gotten messed up. I mean, look at the space junk. It's, I mean, already NASA is having to spend 200 billion, million to reinforce the hulls of spacecraft because they're colliding with this stuff. I mean, imagine anything so stupid. And how are we ever going to clean that up? You know, nobody has got the foggiest idea how that's going to be done. So if it makes societies more future-oriented to get the accounts right, um, I think that um, that will be the main advantage. It will give people a longer-term evaluation. And in the same way that we constructed a portfolio of stocks, of companies, that performed better because there were longer-term evaluations, and we weren't churning those stocks and trying to create a portfolio that uh, went up uh, just based on you know, churning it around and playing the market. Um, the, the proof of what we were doing was in the market break in 1987, October 1987, and where the Standard & Poor's went down, I think, 36% that day. And our portfolio, uh, um, our stock, um, of our fund only dropped 4%. And uh, that was the first time we got an article in Barron's. And uh, the headline of the article was, how come these do-good funds do so well in a down market? <laughs> and it was a very obvious reason, is number one, we were not doing program trading over the Standard & Poor's and the Fortune 500, we weren't even in that market. Those companies have no interest to us at all. Uh, we were over in the over-the-counter market. So we were in a totally different market than they were in. And um, so it, it, uh, it shows that there is room uh, for longer-term evaluations. And you know, I think that a lot of us are beginning to learn what our Native American friends have been telling us about the seventh generation, that it's just simply smarter to invest, to do things right in the first place. And the thing that happens, that I'm hoping will happen, is that this is going to begin to happen at every level. I mean, what's happening now is value changes and behavior are, are changing in terms of individual consumers. You know, people are buying shopping guides to a better world and all of this kind of thing. People are investing in these longer term funds. Um, and then at the corporate level, uh, the companies, I mean, all of the big eight accounting firms now are doing environmental auditing. And it's all very defensive at the moment. They're afraid that they're going to get lawsuits, you know, and the banks are liable, you know, for cleaning up toxic dumps. And then you have local governments and they need to make some changes. They've got to change zoning laws, you know, to make it easier to do solar and renewable energy and make it easier for people to recycle. And then at the national level, we need to change the, the national accounts to one of these new uh, scorecards, and we also need to change the tax system 
And um, I've talked to Senator Gore about this a lot, and he's talked about it in his book, uh, the whole idea of green taxes, where you tax um, overuse of resources and pollution. And where this is mostly being done, there's 85 different kinds of green taxes now uh, in the US and in the Western European countries in Japan. And they range everything from um, levies on bottles, you know, for re non-returnable bottles, to um, emission um, taxes and uh, things like that. And in Germany, they've been selling these to the voters as income tax cuts, because that's exactly what they are. I mean, the revenues from uh, green taxes are so huge that um, you have to cut income taxes as you introduce them. And uh, I did a piece, uh, I, I write columns for uh, the LA Times and the Christian Science Monitor, and I've been doing a lot of columns recently on green taxes and why don't we shift over? Because if you look at what tax systems are supposed to be for, I mean, tax systems are supposed to raise money for the government, yes, but also to reward healthy behavior. Uh, and, you know, in a sense, when we uh, all agree about sin taxes, say, on, on liquor and cigarettes, we are kind of accepting that idea. Well, the green taxes just mean that there's four different new kinds of unhealthy behavior. Polluting, uh, which is unhealthy for everybody. Uh, waste which is, uh, makes us uncompetitive, like excess packaging and all of that. Obsolescence, you know, planned obsolescence, throw away cameras and throw away cigarette lighters, they should be taxed. And then a depletion of natural resources where there's plenty of recycled materials around which could be plugged back into production. And if you introduce those four kinds of green taxes, um, then you begin to discourage unhealthy behavior and, and by removing taxes from income, I mean, well, we ought to be encouraging um, employment. And this is one of the things that I've been trying to tell the Clinton economic team, you know, that you don't want to have tax credits for investment, they want tax credits for employment, that, that the company doesn't get a tax credit unless it can prove it, it's employing somebody. I mean, otherwise, what's to stop them from investing the extra tax credit um, in the Argentine stock market or in German bonds that are paying twice as much interest rates as American bonds? So you see, it's a matter of people not yet understanding the global economy and, um, uh, and this need now to make the planetary environment itself uh, the guide for how we bring our productive systems into line with the way nature works. I mean, once we get that right, uh, we will have sustainable societies that will be perfectly comfortable to live in. Nobody's going to be living in the trees, but it's going to require redesigning not only at those levels up to the national level, um, with these kind of green taxes, but the last level is the international level. And you hear all the politicians talking about leveling the playing field. I'm sure you've heard all this week about trade and all the rest of it. But the problem, if you use economists to design these level playing fields, uh, they tend to use their old models, which will be the lowest common denominator model um, of trade, which tends to level rainforests and level ecosystems and try to homogenize all the cultures in the world, instead of what needs to be done is that the playing field needs to be leveled upward. We need to put an ethical flaw under the global playing field, and we indeed are doing that. We're negotiating treaties and agreements around worker safety, around environmental protection, and I think um, we're going to get more and more agreements around currency, uh, floats, and uh, the last kind of agreement that we need to negotiate at the international level, I think, is uh, to uh, reduce these terrific wage, wage differentials. 
I mean, because it's these huge wage differentials that cause those companies to go madly charging around the, the planet trying to find cheaper and cheaper labor forces. And if we can have a bandwidth within which currencies can fluctuate, why can't we have a bandwidth for, for wages, which you know would not be in currency, but in these purchasing power parities. So you would be kind of a standard of living bandwidth, which would allow a certain amount of differential, but not the crazy differentials that we're dealing with today. And I think once we uh, put that um, flaw under the international playing field, uh, then you find that you're beginning to reward uh, the ethical companies where, and the ethical countries. Whereas right now, are we punishing the ethical companies and the ethical countries? So really, the interventions have to be at all five levels, and luckily they are. I mean, you, if you see them, uh, you see them happening at all those five levels. And um, we can all work at whatever level uh, suits us best. Thank you. <laughs>